Anyways, back to these, these birds. These are used later in the movie as uh, manifestations of the Holy Spirit, roughly speaking. And of course, that's a standard Christian symbol, although, as I mentioned, uh, the dove all often represents the Holy Spirit, and we'll talk about that later. But um, this movie has very strong pagan elements in it, as I mentioned before, as opposed to strictly Christian symbolism. But, but that's a foreshadowing. And what it foreshadows is that, well, a new day has dawned. It's the emergence of new consciousness. And everything last night went well, really well. Everything in the, let's call it the unconscious, say, after time stops. That all went well, and so the new day is full of promise. And so the birds are singing and the sun is shining and like, hooray! And so that's exactly, so that sets, this is the next scene, right? So it sets the tenor for that scene just like the introductory song does. So, so anyways, then you see all these kids playing and enthusiastic, so they're off to school which is presented in a positive light, and so that's how, where you get socialized. So it's Pinocchio is ready to go beyond the boundaries of the familial home. And he's ready because his father prepared him and because his mother prepared him. And so he goes off, and he's not going off alone, he's going with his conscience. And, which is sort of the, inter you could think about it again, as the internalized representation of nature and society. And so he's not going out there alone, even though he's not very good at it. And so he's pretty excited about this, and so is Geppetto. See, Geppetto isn't standing there paralyzed with terror. And the kid isn't phobic of the outside world. And so that's, he's, he's, re he's treating it as an adventure. I mean, he, even though, well, it's an adventure, but adventures can be dangerous. What if the other, you can imagine a kid, especially one who's like high in neuroticism, who hasn't been encouraged sufficiently to overcome that, let's say, their primary idea might be, well, what if the other kids don't like me? That's a big one. What if the teachers don't like me? What if the other kids won't play with me? It's like, yeah, what if? That's rough, man. And if, if you're not a playful kid, it could easily be the case. So, but that's not Pinocchio. He's like spinning out, ready to go. And so, good, good. He's got naive, but enthusiastic. Okay, well, that at least gets the ball rolling. Now, you've got these two evil creatures here. The fox and the cat. Um, I think this one's based on one of the Marx brothers, actually, Harpo Marx, who I believe never said anything. But be that as it may, there are these ne'er do well characters. Um, the fox, in particular. Now, fox is a standard trickster animal, right? It's a, it's, a, it's 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 a classic animal. Maybe because it's it's good at hiding and it's good at hunting. I don't know exactly why, but it's it, and coyotes are like that too. They're classic trickster animals. Um, he's kind of like Wiley e. Coyote, in fact, you know, the, the, the Warner Brothers character who's genius at large and, of course, whose arrogance continually gets him walloped. And this character has a lot of features like that, but he, he's, he feigns being a, an English gentleman of like the 1890s and pretends to be educated and, and uh, he has a kind of high-blown way of talking and he's a fraud through and through and he's got, he's got this, you know, sidekick who is barely there at all, and he, he doesn't treat him that well, but, but he's got someone to lord it over, so that keeps his dominance hierarchy thing going well, and the fact that he's like a second-rate companion, well, he never really notices that, although he'll treat him contemptuously whenever he gives a chance. So anyways, they're walking down the street, and the, the uh, fox is bragging away about some crooked thing that he's done, and how he pulled the wool over someone's eyes, and he confuses that with uh, wisdom and intelligence. And one of the things that you see, this is worth knowing too, because if you're preyed upon by a psychopath, which you will be to some degree at some point in your life, the psychopath, who will be narcissistic, will presume that you're stupid and, and, and that you deserve to be taken advantage of because you're naive and stupid. So it's actually a good thing that he's doing it. And, uh, he, his proof for, and I'm saying he because there are more male psychopaths um, the, uh, the proof that you're stupid naive is that he can take advantage of you And so, like if you were wiser, you'd, you'd be, you know, you'd, you'd know his tricks And then it wouldn't be morally necessary for him to show you just exactly who knows what about what And so the psychopath will use his ability to, to fool you as proof of his own Grandiose, grandiose omnipotence, omniscience, and narcissism. And the problem with that is that you, you can be fooled by a psychopath, and virtually anybody can. 
so that Robert Hare, for example, who studied psychopaths for a long time and interviewed a lot of them, like hundreds of them and videotaped many of the interviews, he said when he was talking to the psychopath, he always believed what they were saying and then he'd watch the video afterwards and see where the conversation went off the rails but, you know, the, pro pro the proclivity to be polite in a conversation is very strong and if you're polite, you don't object to the way that the person unfolds their strategy, you know and psychopaths are pretty good at figuring out how to manipulate, obviously, how to manipulate people and the probability that you will be immune to that is extraordinarily low go watch Paul Bernardo being interviewed by policemen on, on the YouTube that's bloody, it, that's enlightening, man Paul Bernardo, he's like the CEO of a meeting in that video, you know he gives the cops hell, he gives the lawyers hell, he protests his innocence he basically tells them that they're rude and untrustworthy because they don't trust him because he did a few little things 17 years ago and he gets away with it, a few little things, right? I mean, he killed a bunch of people, including the sister of his girlfriend at the time and, you know, he was a repeat sexual offender and murderer it's like, but he basically goes, well, you know that's a long time ago, it's like we're, we're past that, aren't we? I mean, I'm having a discussion with you, I'm trying to solve, help you solve some crimes which, by the way, I committed, but we won't bring that up you know, and you're, 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 you're accusing me of being a liar like, you're not playing fair, what, what's up with you? and then when they answer, he looks at his fingernails which is like, that's a lovely little manipulative thing because it basically means whatever happens to be under my fingernail at the moment is much higher priority than listening to your foolish story and you watch, you'll see people do that to you and then you get a little insight into what they're up to he's very good at that and so, or he looks outside or he, or, or he just looks at his hands or he looks out the window immediately dismissive in his nonverbal behavior it's brilliant that the, the courts were forced to release that, by the way but it, look it up, Paul Bernardo on YouTube wow, it's, it's just mind-boggling he's so good at what he does and he's good-looking and he's charismatic and, you know, he can really pull it off and you can't tell what's happening with the cops and the lawyers whether they're just letting him play his routine to get some information from him or whether he's actually setting them back on his heels and I suspect it's a bit of both but, uh, it's a masterful performance if you didn't know who he was and you were watching it without the audio you'd think he's the CEO of some company giving his employees hell for not being up to scratch that's all his body language his eye contact, everything just speaks that it's amazing